might, I might just have to switch these round um, halfway through because this is just running on uh, battery. Um, other <coughs> issues, you know, when I started last time, and uh, most of you were here for the last session, um, the focus is now changing from that idea that you can each create your own living theory to a focus on um, the idea that the multimedia, that, that new technologies can transform uh, the very meanings that we are communicating. So from text-based <coughs> representations, and all of you in terms of an academic institution will know that the international referee journals are almost all text-based. Um, there are some, for example, in South Africa, the South African academics, they get quite a bit of money if they uh, publish in particular journals. Almost every one of those journals, if not every one, is just print-based. So I've been trying to uh, communicate very different meanings using uh, multimedia narratives. It doesn't deny the value of print-based work. It doesn't deny the value of drawing on traditional theory, but it's saying as educators, if we want to explain our educational influences, especially, and I hope you feel a certain energy coming from me as I'm with you, because just being with a group of passionate educators evokes in me that kind of energy with values that I'm passionate about. I've been trying to say that unless you actually show with visual data some of your own practices, just as this is my practice now, this is what I do, you're missing really important meanings. Okay, so that will be the emphasis just on the second part of the talk. Now, is there anything that you feel uh, just at the beginning that you would like me to address in terms of any issues? Because I always like to get a sense of what my audience is coming with. Is there anything that you I'll explain why, because the very first conference I attended was in 1977, and uh, I attracted an audience of one, okay? This was at a big national conference, one person came, and I was talking on local curriculum development, and I actually didn't introduce myself, I talked at this person for 15 minutes, when he put his hand up, and he said, uh, Jack, um, I'd just like to introduce myself, and then he transpired, he was the international expert in the field, he was a man called Long Standards. <laughs> So he said, I've only just got one suggestion. Um, perhaps you could develop your sense of audience. Would you like to come for a drink? Right? <laughs> Since then, I've always wanted to hear if the audience, if the participants have got anything that they wish to pursue or are ideas or issues they want to need to take up. So I'll just pause there and just say, is there anything that you're feeling, you know, just from what you've read about the talk or what I've been doing that you'd like me to uh, consider? No? You're okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. The, the importance of... Uh-oh. Have we done again? Do it RGB1 trial. No. RBG. Oh, it's on here. Two minutes? No. Yeah, it's this thing, I think. No. Is this it? No. 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 Maybe no. it's I a think it is. Yeah. 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 Success. You Success. never trust me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do. <laughs> Yeah, I just want to um, just show you something. Um, just to start with, as a, a visual, we call it just visual data. And I think all of you will have access uh, to this technology. Now, all I use, um, because I use the Apple Mac, I've got access uh, to something called iMovie, which would allow you, for example, with the videotapes here, directly into the computer. I can edit those, compress them, put them onto YouTube. This is one that uh, I put onto YouTube for a student of mine called Marian Naidu. Now, I just want you to watch something. Can you hear that? No. I think it's that one that just needs. Um, right, shall we try it? Something had to be done. It had to be done yesterday. Appearance causes helped me tremendously. As some other people gave us a benefit of their knowledge and advice, I'd have to think about what it meant to myself and especially my wife. 
Well, I'll show you some non-verbal um, issues first before I try to get the sound back. But the digital technology allows you to do this. That prior to the digital technology, we could not do this. We could not move the cursor. So sometimes with an hour's lecture, I can move it very quickly uh, backwards and forwards. Okay? Now, with this, okay, no, it's okay. <coughs> what I want you to watch is this that the husband, George, is talking to my student who was called Marion, and about Marion. Marion is also the name of the wife. They've been married 50 years. Marion has Alzheimer's, and if you look at this moment as uh, Marion just started the clip here, Marion is looking quite, we say, comatose. You know, in terms of Alzheimer's, if you've had a relative uh, with Alzheimer's, as I have, you'll know what it's like, okay? Now, George is talking, not being able to see Marion. He's talking to my student, Marion, about all the things he does as a carer. There are an enormous amount of things that George is really, if you like, proud of himself, that he's doing all of these things as a carer. Now, I just want you to watch, not George, but Marion. See, George is just chatting away. He's talking very quickly. Marion comes to. Now watch this. In a few minutes, I'll come. Okay. <laughs> now, from somebody where the communications uh, are almost non-existent, so you see the comatose. And here, unmistakably, She's actually saying, if you like, look at George, isn't he big-headed, talking yeah. all the thing he's doing for me, yeah? And it's beautiful, the, the look on her face there, looking at my student, Marion. My student in the examination just kept moving the cursor like this and saying, here, okay? And pointing to this. So, this was what Mary, my student, showed to her examiners mm -hmm. and gradually communicated the embodied expression of what she called a passion for compassion. Mm -hmm. Now, without this kind of data, mm -hmm. Marion would not have been able to communicate what was at the heart of her thesis mm -hmm. about this passion for compassion. Mm -hmm. Are you okay with this? Because this use of the digital technology is something that everybody here can actually use. I, I don't know, how many of you have used this uh, and put it on the web? Have you? Um, well, I, I studied in the UK and I submitted my thesis. Um, it's, it's already old. But I, I also had um, videotapes for the same purposes to show, um, I investigated the discourse to ensure, to show the uh, actually, the cultural effects of the uh, classroom discourse, and without the videos, I think uh, lots of things would be missed out. And in the uh, Viva, I learned that uh, both my examiners, the external and the internal, have watched all the three complete videos, and some of the questions were based on. So, how, how many others? Is it just one person that has, yourself, yeah? Done the same? Yes, yes, the same, but I'm working in the hospital. With the, with the hospital, the children. Yeah. The baby children, so I'm born with the chain of ethic and the, and the cultural defense because most of the children are Arab. So it's a, it's a problem to show them that they don't want to, take a, to be involved in this. Uh, 
I don't. The ethics of this kind of research are really important. That we have to go through ethical permissions. Um, I'll show you where some of the children have actually done their action research themselves, six-year-olds and ten-year-olds. <coughs> and they've videotaped with parental permissions, uh, and they're on the web. Now, if there are just two of you in this whole room that have used this technology, and I think with your videotapes, it sounds as if the digitalization wasn't there. People would have to watch the whole video. With the digital technology, you can now put this, for example, onto YouTube, you can edit, you can move the cursor backwards and forwards to this point of what is becoming known as empathetic resonance. You know when I showed you that of Marion there, the cursor moving backwards and forwards, and there is a moment where I'm feeling the strongest resonance with the expression of meaning. Now, I've been calling that empathetic resonance. Are you okay with this? Because you've all got this um, capacity to communicate what it is you're doing with your students and others. You'll all be expressing these kinds of values which carry an energy, and I would say a spiritual energy. Even if you're like me and non-religious, you still have got a spiritual energy. It's life-affirming. And you're carrying values that really matter. On a text, paper text, print-based text, as I say, it becomes too limited to communicate these meanings as they are expressed in practice, just as you saw Marion comatose on a couch. And it was only over the time of that interaction Suddenly, George was completely, you know, <laughs> explaining very passionately what he was doing for Marion. Now, you wouldn't have gotten that sense of passion for compassion without that movement, and then showing that beautiful moment of communication. Now, each one of you, I think, could show, not planned, you can't get these things in a planned way, but each one of you will have moments with your students, you know, in almost every class, where these qualities are being communicated and you're being responsive to your students <coughs> in a way that shows the values that are being lived in the college. Now, at the moment, uh, you don't have this database. I, I know next week, um, I think we're saying that there's something... Mm -hmm. no. Yeah. Going Hopefully. <laughs> Would you like to say what that is? I think if I understand. Yeah. I told yeah. that uh, hopefully next week our uh, English side will, will be on the song. <laughs> For next week? Yeah. But what I said I'd do is um, that I would... Um, have a look at the statements and then just respond from the perspectives that I've been offering today. Because if you were to take your work with the video, the work you're working on the hospital, with, and we know the ethical issues that are present there, but to share these with your colleagues in a way that each one of you becomes familiar with what you're all doing. Because in this room, you have the potential to create a very significant social movement. If you will all bring your embodied knowledge as educators into the public domain, as I'm showing you here, and this is, as I said, an electronic portal. At the moment, apart from a maths uh, thesis, it's coming this way. Do you follow? That at the moment, the only one going that way to the world is that one of a maths on becoming a better dialogical educator. But it's clear to me, just as the conversations, as people have been coming up to me and just talking about what they're doing, that there is an enormous amount of high-quality embodied knowledge within this room. But it's not being made public. Now, the Moffitt Institute in Tel Aviv has got a name in terms of its writing centre. To make public the professional and practical knowledge of educators. I asked the question, could you show me the evidence that this is being done? And there isn't any evidence of this kind that I'm showing you. So I think that if we will just focus on this, and you will bring, as I say, your embodied knowledge, hopefully with some of the visual, into the public domain, it will make a difference, not only to colleagues, you share it together, but you start to feel yourselves as having significance in the wider world of the academy, and I mean in global. Because in this room, as I say, immense depth and extent of embodied knowledge of education. And yet, it's remaining.
possibly just within your classrooms. You, now that's great, that's the bedrock of it all. But like um, Marion here, Marion Naidu, this is her thesis, and you're asking about the children you know, in the hospital. Uh, Marion's is the closest that I've got because Marion worked with uh, Alzheimer's patients, she advised uh, the Labour government on policy um, in terms of health. But this is how, and I showed you, this is how you can access it. Um, and Mariam, I'm a storyteller. The focus of this narrative is on my learning and the development of my living educational theory. Now, Mariam was interested in uh, healthcare, so <coughs> this sense of multi-professional, multi-agency healthcare setting in order to improve the quality of care provided. Now, I, I think that you would be interested in helping to improve the educational quality with the children. And you could bring that knowledge. And I know ethically you'll have difficulty, but some of the parents might give permissions for this kind of work to be done and made public. And the value space will be very important. Now, I'll just go back to, uh, so you can just hopefully just get a little more of just the, the sense of this, where George, you'll hear. Let's just see if the sound is better. Um, I'm just check. No, it's not. That's a shame. It's clear. It's clear. I can hear it. The transition period was very hard, as I had to change my way of life. It's not like quite to say I was a very impatient sort of person. If something had to be done, it had to be done yesterday, or else I got very upset. The nearest course has helped me tremendously. Gave us the benefit of their knowledge and advice, and helped me to think about what it meant to myself, and especially my wife. But caring, but to care in general, it means that if it's the man that is the carer, then he has to learn to manage the home, cooking, housekeeping, shopping, etc. If it's the woman that is the carer, then it's the other way. She has to cope with emergencies in the home, such as change of fuses, washes, and multitude of other jobs. That used to be done by our spouse or partner. <laughs> the carers course and the follow-up meetings give you a chance to meet people that are in the same position as yourself when you thought that you were alone and nobody cared. Jack, let me say about the Arab something ethical. Would you like to? Yeah. yeah. Uh, what you said about the ethical of getting permission of, uh, to be photographed, uh, uh, Marius, the solution that we found because I took videotapes of me and my students. I didn't know I would do research on that. And the uh, examiners permitted us for me to show the movie, because I couldn't get permission, it was two years later, to show the movie to Jack and to a validation group. So we were a small group and they uh, wrote what, they, they validated what I uh, claim that is seen in the video. And I put it in because we have such a problem here. I have the same problem, so it's not, uh, I, I can't, I wouldn't, it wouldn't be ethical to, uh, to make it public You should even find someone, because I, I, I did a research on children with autism and their parents, and most of them didn't want their videos being displayed on, on the internet, but we always find one family that will allow it, or at least one, and that's what we did. <coughs> so you've done the set with the, yeah. the video? The ethical issues are really important, and as you say, I've always found um, it possible to show what it is that uh, is important with ethical permissions. Um, I'll, I'll just mention something in Canada where one of the uh, teachers took his proposal to an ethics committee of the university, it's called Brock University, and uh, Brock University refused to allow him uh, to conduct his own classroom research on himself. Right? But what they couldn't stop him doing was researching the influence of the Ethics Committee on his research. <laughs> so I put his dissertation on the web to show that you can always find a way you know, to overcome some of those, um, if you like, hostile constraints. If people are stopping you, actually academic freedom is a very powerful principle. And Jeff, he's called Sediment Gladwell, did a superb dissertation literally explaining why the Ethics Committee was actually unethical in stopping him researching his own practice. Now, I know these things are difficult, but you can't avoid sometimes quite painful and difficult experiences. Um, but I think your ethical ones are really important. Um, did you get that in the sense of George here? Um, it's really lovely that 50 years they've been married, there's George, very articulate, 
you know, really clearly showing what he's doing as a carer, but my student was able to communicate that sense of the meaning of a passion for compassion by showing what Marion was doing at this moment, where she was just showing from that comatose state, as I say, and you'll always get there. You, you always, you feel right. Somebody with Alzheimer's, you're told she's got Alzheimer's, you feel there will be no communication. And then, that, as I say, that life comes back, uh, she hears what he's saying, it's there, she takes, she's really attending, <laughs> and it's there. Yeah, so it's that beautiful moment, which, again, Marion is looking directly at my student, Marion, and Marion used that moment, as I say, in her doctoral thesis, to communicate that sense of the passion for compassion. And you can get that uh, from the Living Theory section of my website. Uh, you just go into it, actionresearch.net, Living Theories, here's Marion's, and you can access the whole thesis, including the abstract. Yeah. Now, if we take that, that vignette there, what was actually happening? In other words, why was she filming him reading from the paper? It was to do with what carers um, actually do. So she was wanting to get the nature of the interaction that she was actually creating uh, with George. And this was not intended. Um, whilst Marion was there, the actual video was to, um, just as George was explaining, that Marion was very impressed with how George could explain what he was doing. Okay, so the purpose of the video in this case was not what actually came out of it. The, the what came out with that clip and Marion suddenly showing this and it touched Marion the researcher deeply to actually bring this into her thesis. What do you think? No, well, well, he was reading from a written text. Yeah. Did he produce that? I'm interested in how, how it led up to this moment. Obviously something had been done up to this moment. Yeah, that Mar uh, my student Marion was interested in caring. Yeah, and what carers actually do. And she was very, very impressed with George in terms of everything that he was doing for Marion. So she just asked him to prepare a text because he didn't feel comfortable just by speaking without a text to support it. And so Marion was actually, and she's done such a lot of video uh, with the groups, with the individuals, but this was the, the one that the intention was just to actually show George actually explaining to others what he was actually doing. And again, she was very impressed with his clarity, but he wouldn't do it without a script. So that, that's the antecedent to this. Um, but there, lots of this come out in an unplanned way, that almost all of the videos I use, um, they've happened spontaneously. You, you know, there's one international conference in Montreal with one of my PhD students who was a superintendent of schools. She was on an international panel and was suddenly asked, I've got this on uh, the video in the talk I gave um, in um, Tel Aviv. Um, and she was suddenly asked about the support for teacher research in her um, school board. And you suddenly see her coming alive with an energy and a pleasure and a delight as she identifies with a support group that suddenly mobilized itself to provide support for this one teacher who was asking if there was any support for teacher research. And that communicated, what Jackie Delonge is called, the life, we call it life-affirming energy and the values that Jackie uses. But again, you couldn't have planned it. You know, a lot of this video, just by video, uh, you can always, with this cursor, you can do it very quickly. You don't have to view, as you would have to do, an hour or two, like with the examiners going through the whole lot. You can very quickly move the cursor backwards and forwards and actually use those moments in your visual narrative. Now, for those, um, you may not feel um, confident about integrating this kind of material within your written reports, <coughs> and yet the actual procedure uh, of doing this isn't <coughs> very complex. I, I'm just curious about how many of you have, um, have you got your own YouTube channels at all? Have, have yeah? No? So, for example, if you click um, on YouTube, can you actually access um, your own video clips that you've got up there or not? Yeah? But how many of you are doing it? 
So, it's just that, right, so this, how simple this is, is those clips I have on my desktop, which you could do with what you've got there. I can just drag and drop onto the YouTube. You get your account free. Um, all of my YouTube's clips are here. So they all come up. I've got hundreds. I must have got over 500 um, clips. Now, each one of those uh, has got what we call a URL. Now, I'll just, I'll just see if I can demonstrate this so that you could all use it if you decide you want to. But if you have got your Word open, your Word document open, here I am about three weeks ago, what is that, 30th of June, it was only a couple of weeks ago, um, I was giving a, a seminar in Mauritius, uh, and this guy giving a keynote at a Microsoft-sponsored seminar in Mauritius. Again, I was expressing, I hope you can feel the certain energy um, embodied in my expression with you, because if I have an influence with anybody here, right, supposing something that I've said um, stimulates your creativity, and if you know, I think I might use that, okay? Now, I don't think we'd be able to explain my influence, which requires your creativity. I can never say, because I did this, then that happened. You, you know, it's not a causal relationship between you and I. You have got to exercise your originality and creativity, and whatever it is I'm doing, to have any influence in your learning. But if I try to explain, coming to Oranin College, yeah, and that next year, some of you are inquiring of, you know, how do I improve my practice? Can I bring my embodied knowledge and share it with others? I don't think you'll be able to explain my influence without that energy that I'm expressing in the here and now. And to do that, I'm saying, this is where the video and the visual helps. But what you can do, you put it onto YouTube. And what I like about this is that the simplicity with which you can often just take for example, I've got a clip here of me in Mauritius. Now, I don't know how many of, of you have done this. All I did was I just dragged and dropped it from YouTube onto my, my Word document. How easy it is. Do you now, if I click here and I bring up, you look here, I bring up the YouTube video. <coughs> so there I am in Mauritius. <coughs> right. Thank you, Mr. Oba. We are all sure that as long as you are there, things will keep on improving uh, in this area. So, we now have the pleasure to invite Jack. Uh, okay, so he's just introducing me to his seminar. Can it, here, we've got the URL for that video clip. Now, all I do is copy and just paste that here. And I've then integrated, okay, into my paper. That is now live. You can then create your narrative around what you're showing about your practice. Now, each one of you will have this life-affirming energy, the values you use to give meaning and purpose to your lives, which, if you like, you've never brought into an academic paper. And you certainly want to be in it visual, you know, with a visual narrative, showing the meanings you're expressing in your relationships with your students. With this technology now, with the digital technology, onto YouTube, straight into your Word document, you can then build up, and I'll show you one or two illustrations of where people have got both their masters and their doctorates from doing this. You can actually integrate the visual from what you're doing into your written text and it transforms the meanings.
because you can bring in, as I've done, in terms of what I call a life-affirming energy. Um, I gave a keynote in New York, and I videotaped this keynote, and it was quite transformatory because um, up to that point, I'd be quite angry. Every time I talked about some of the experiences at my university, you know, where uh, some people had tried to get my employment terminated, you know, as I said, and sacked me, uh, I had questions raised about my research. Now, even as I'm speaking to you now, I'm not angry. If you'd seen me five years ago, I would be reliving it in a way that I would be furious. Okay, so I would be communicating this furious anger. You know? Now, in the keynote in New York, there is a moment where there is a transformation taking place, where I re-channel the anger in the moment into what I'm feeling with you now, which is this kind of an energy which is life-affirming and definitely creative. Now, I think all of you will recognize in your lives experiences which have been quite painful, some have been humiliating, where you're feeling the anger and the fury. But you can't keep dwelling there because it gets in the way of you expressing yourself creatively with your students, with, if you like that loving energy. Now, in the keynote in um, Tel Aviv, I actually put this clip up with a bit of visual narrative to explain the importance of that re-channeling of the emotional energy in, in the moment. But I could not do it without the visual data. Now, before I show you uh, just one or two illustrations of where people have worked uh, in an action research way to create their uh, master's units, for, they've also done their doctorates, for example. Um, I'll just close this. If you want to see Jack Whitehead angry, go into his uh, web page and you see him telling the story while he was still very angry. <laughs> yeah, I, I put this on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. I put it on YouTube. I, I have a reenactment of this. Um, I met a committee in the university. It had been constituted by Senate to investigate what Senate believed where they said, prima facie evidence of a breach of my academic freedom, right? Now, this committee reported, and all it did was conclude that my academic freedom had not been breached. That, that was it, the conclusion. And I got this report, it was quite a thick report, and then the end, uh, Mr. White, Dr. White had uh, academic freedom, our conclusion is, had not been breached. <coughs> so I went to this committee, and I, I videotaped my response to it, because after about 15, 20 minutes, uh, I left, I, I, my whole body was feeling defeated. Okay, so there it was, uh, Mr. Whitehead's academic freedom not been breached. I didn't seem to be able to shift. And I felt dejected, uh, really humiliated, and my whole body was one of defeat. And I left, I got up, and I started, I got to the door. And suddenly, and I don't know why, but my whole body filled with an anger. It, and it was no. And I turned back to the committee, and I was furious, but I was very clear. Okay, so, and I then reenacted it on video and put it onto YouTube. As I explained to this committee how they were denying their responsibility as academics if they didn't acknowledge the pressure to which I'd been subjected. Because I had resisted the pressure, so my academic freedom had not been breached. Do you follow? They were right that I had published. But the pressure to which I'd been subjected <laughs> was not recognized in that conclusion. And now, it's on YouTube, I mean, you'll feel it. You'll feel the fury and the anger. People who've seen it recognize it. Now, that committee, to do them justice, changed their conclusion. So it then read to Senate, uh, our conclusion is that uh, Mr. White's uh, academic freedom has not been breached. This was, however, because of his persistence in the face of pressure. A less determined individual could well have been oppressed and constrained. Now, that's satisfied. But if I hadn't at the door feeling totally and utterly defeated, then being filled with the rejection of that, yeah? and I come back, uh, and even if I hadn't got that decision, nevertheless, I would have felt that I hadn't just left defeated. Now, again, I think it's very important to acknowledge the truth of some of these experiences and get them into uh, one's account. I know it's not easy, um, but because I was protected by the law of academic freedom, I could actually publish. Yeah. 20 more minutes. Okay. okay. 
Now, if I just show you this, because, is there anything else that you feel, uh, before I go on and just show you one or two examples of the actual research cycle and the integration of the visual? Just say if there's anything that you're feeling. Is there something that you can show concerning art? Because we have here the head of the art department. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so if I go back into my uh, web page, now, you'll see, um, if I go to the central, uh, the beginning of the page. Now, on the, this What's New section down here, on the right-hand side, you've got a whole lot of um, things that have been produced over the last year. Now, there's one which has been produced by an artist who refers to himself as a socially engaged artist. That's how he sees himself. It's called Andy Henner. Now, the part here about stories creating futures, um, edited by Andrew Henner, it, it's very much about an artist uh, showing how art is vital in terms of this idea of socially engaged practice. So the whole text, if you go into this, um, creativity works, the socially engaged arts, art as lived experience. And you've got the, I think it's a beautifully presented um, set of narratives. Each one of them is using art to communicate something very significant. But that is, um, as I say, in this text, which you can use freely, you know, that Andy, again, has made this available as a gift. Uh, but it's all about the idea of living legacies. Now, I'll just try and move up to this um, Wiley's book, and then there was the cover story by Andrew Hennon. But the one thing that I'd like you to read, if you do access this, is the one that is by Catherine Forrester called what is a living legacy? Because Catherine had um, tried to leave teaching uh, about 18 months ago. Uh, the diagnosis uh, was life-threatening, uh, yet Catherine was doing a Red D and wants to finish this Red D with what she calls a living legacy. She wants to leave something which is of value to others. And uh, this is a lovely story, I think, of Catherine what is a living legacy, which everybody here, I think, you could leave for others. So there are pivotal moments in our lives, moments that can change our direction, our aspirations, our hearts and minds, even our spirits, and whoever we construe ourselves to be. That's right. So I do hope you'll access this, because where is the head of art? Is that... Where is the head? Yeah. It, it's just that a number of the living theory theses, including one by an Afro-Caribbean guy, if you can remember, called Eden Charles. He uses his art um, to humanize some of the experience that he's had. And he had some very painful experiences, but you'll see he's included his art uh, to communicate some of the more difficult experiences. He worked in Sierra Leone with women that had been raped by uh, the rebels. The rebels had killed the women's husbands. The women had had children by after being raped, and Eden actually shows how much he learned in terms of basic humanity from working with the women. But he uses his art, okay, to do that. So I, I think again that art is very, very significant indeed. Okay, is that all? Yeah. Is there anything else that before I just show you this um, this action research? I don't know if you've seen this kind of cycle ever before, but. Uh, this is called the Task Wheel. It was developed by Bell Wallace, 19 years in KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. Um, and it's got an action reflection cycle within it, which goes, you know, uh, what do I know about this? As you ask your question, how do I improve it? You know, what's the task? What do I want to improve? How many ideas can I think of? Choose an idea that you're going to act on. Act on it. Ask yourself and evaluate how well did you do. And then the communication. Let's tell someone. What have I learned? That is where the living theory comes in. Explain to others uh, the nature of the learning that's taking place. Now, I like this task wheel. As I say, you can access this from uh, my website. Um, you just get into the... the uh, I'll just show you where you can access it. 
it's on the front page of the website and it's in uh, the action planning, it's this one, in improving practice, are you okay with this? And generating knowledge. Um, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but if you go into that, you'll, you'll find about halfway down uh, the task wheel, integrating the action reflection cycle, uh, and here the action planner, this is one I always use with the beginning action researchers, they just go through, well, what do I want to improve? Why do I feel that something could be improved? Uh, what could I do that might improve it? You'll see it's got the same action reflection cycle as a task wheel. Um, how am I acting? What data will I collect to enable to make a judgment? I talked earlier about Habermas. Here are the questions that we asked to strengthen the validity. Okay, so, yeah? Is it only about improving or about describing to uh, If I want to describe the process or, or, or just about improving? No, it, it, this is very important because you're... An action research always starts with a grounding in practice that you want to improve. That's the key difference often with an action research program to a different kind of research program. You're always starting with, well, how do I improve this? Now, where it becomes not only the description is important, but even more important than the description is the explanation. Okay, so you then move and with that action reflection cycle to actually describing what it is that you feel is improved, but more importantly, to explain it. Because I don't even know, but this notion of descriptive adequacy is not as academically or um, important as explanatory adequacy. You know, you can describe something, but what a lot of people like to understand are the reasons why something happens, <coughs> to give the reasons to explain. So you move from the practice, and it's research because it's systematic inquiry made public. You must make it public through description and explanation. Now, the person who's done that, in a way that you might enjoy, um, is a senior educational psychologist. She was one of the last to get her living theory thesis uh, accepted. I'll just show you. If you go into the living theory thesis, um, you can get into um, Marie Huxtable's here, and it's a how do I evolve living educational theory praxis. But you can, so you can access, yep. With freely from the website, but I'll just show you what um, Murray did using the action reflection cycle. If ever you want to um, communicate how to do this, you can access from my website, the master's section, this illustration of how somebody has used the action reflection cycle in the first master's module she did. She said, uh, I want to show that I can do a master's module on education inquiry by action research before I register for my doctorate. And after the people, the committee had seen this, there was no question that she could um, register for a doctorate. But you'll see that what uh, Maria's done, how can I improve my practice, and it means walking the talk, in other words, I'm not just rhetoric, I'm not just expressing myself rhetorically, I'm doing it. And the reference to dealing with doorsteps are the barriers and the constraints that she's feeling as she goes through her inquiry. So she wants to walk her talk, but also show that she's meeting constraints, difficulties, and overcoming them. Now, a practice is a living contradiction. I've talked about that. But what I want you to just have a look at um, is this, that she's dealt with the task wheel. But what she's done in this inquiry, and a lot of people like this, because as a first action inquiry, they feel secure in using the action reflection cycle. So she shows from the task wheel in the organization which she's gathered, she's organized. And you'll see that the headings follow. What's the task? Generating ideas and selecting, implementing, evaluating, communicating, learning from experience. So do, do you get the idea that, that if somebody asks you, just for an illustration about how somebody might write this up, uh, within an action reflections form, you've got a lovely illustration here of how it can be done. Not for anybody else to follow as a template, but it just gives confidence you can use that kind of inquiry. And Marie, within her doctorate, um, you'll see that she uses multimedia um, almost more than anybody else. It's, it's a very, very impressive um, set of multimedia resources, which I'll just go into it so you can see into the Living Theory Theses. And if you want a, a, a good illustration, that's the best illustration we've got so far. Dublin City University, Yvonne Grotti, 
And this really is a beautiful um, multimedia text. She's a, a lecturer in e-learning at Dublin City University, and she uses a tremendous amount of multimedia. Yeah, five I, I, minutes. Five minutes, right. So I'll just show you very quickly. Um, you can get the access to Marie's, but also I'll then show you how to access this Journal of Living Theory um, to show you how you can get published multimedia accounts. But again, with Marie's, you'll see but if you just go down, um, and it's actually, if you have a look at um, the contents, the list of videos, and this is in particular significant, which goes through how she's using visual narrative to communicate her meaning. But if you ever want to publish um, your texts, multimedia texts, you can do it from here. You can go into the Educational Journal of Living Theories, and you've got access to a wide range of different contributions, which you've got the current issue, the special issue, and the archives. Okay, so if anybody expresses skepticism that action research can be used by six-year-olds and ten-year-olds in classrooms, I always send them to the archive, to the very first issue of October, 2008, and if you go into this one of Franco Bogner in Croatia with his colleague Marika, you get these pupils as action researchers, improving something important in our lives. And if you click on that, it takes you into the account. And what's so beautiful about this, I really like the way he's integrated videos of the children um, explaining how they've been doing action research to their peers, their other 10-year-olds, bringing the evidence of their claims into the class. Um, I won't actually show you too much of this now, but it, it, it's that same thing that I, I showed you here. Uh, a 10-year-old pupil, there's an English translation because this is in uh, Croatian. Uh, a 10-year-old actually going through the action reflection cycle, bringing evidence to her classroom to justify the claims that she's making. Um, and you can access that from the first issue of the Educational Journal of Living Theories. Uh, that is, as I say, go to my web page, into the top, and then you can access this. The special issue is probably one of the most significant in terms of the use of digital technology, because all of these are, well, Yvonne Grotti is the, uh, the doctorate, she's the lecturer, the supervisor of these. These are master students who've all done their visual narratives with video artifacts and got them published in that issue of the journal. Now, that's where you can actually access them in terms of multimedia accounts. And I hope that I've covered, you know, enough to stimulate you about the value of this kind of representation uh, so that you might decide to try it yourselves. Are we okay? Yes, except we are uh, asked to publish in academic, uh, rec academic journals. Is this considered an academic journal? No, you've got... This is the issue for multimedia text at the moment. We're submitting uh, the Education Journal Living Theories to what are known as the international databases for that recognition. And that process is underway. But of course, the multimedia journals are still too young. You know, they haven't had the time. And this is part of the pressure. You're all getting pressure to publish in the refereed international journals. Where do you go? Print-based text. You, so there's a, there's a real tension here between wanting to break with the epistemology of the traditional and still valuing some of it, but at the same time wanting to show there's a new epistemology that Schoen talked about in 96. He said, look, we need a new epistemology for the new scholarship of teaching. In his view, it will only come from action research. And that, unfortunately, he died of cancer before he could develop it. But somebody as influential as Donald Scher recognizing you move from reflective practice to creating a new epistemology from action research is very significant. Are, are we okay now? Are, are, are you okay on that? Yeah. yeah. Uh, if there are any questions, this is the time. Uh, thank you, Jack, very much. Pleasure. <laughs>